What is going on, everybody? We're going to hey let guys. people roll in. We got a big one today. Lots of folks on here. People are tripping in. Excellent. Let us, let us know in the comments where everyone is coming in from. Uh, if I haven't seen any of you in a while, I'm Chris from AppSumo. Um, I am in Austin, Texas right now, and we have a very special guest today who is, you're also in Austin right now, yeah? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, you're right down yeah, the street. Like five miles away from each other right now. <laughs> well, I, so for people watching, I told, special guest is Kelly, by the way, I told her not to come in because our Wi-Fi is sometimes unstable, so it's better to have us diversifying our, our Wi-Fi connection so at least one of us <laughs> is connected at all times. But uh, awesome, we got people in Montreal, Columbia, Chicago, Ohio, Florida, Toronto, a lot of Canadians in the building. Awesome. Yes, oh my gosh. Very cool. Excited. Welcome, guys. Bangkok. Welcome, Bangkok. I feel like everyone here has better weather than we do. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> Where else is it 103 degrees? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm just cooking some eggs on the sidewalk outside, actually, as part of my yeah, like, perfect. routine. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We're going to get going in just one minute. All right. We got Dallas, Texas feeling the hey, heat. Hey, Dallas. Australia. Kelly, we got people in Australia. It's 2 a.m. there. They oh want to get their party on. Las Vegas. Yep. Fort Worth. What up? What's going on, everybody's? Everybody's. <laughs> so, uh, let me get some more topo. In there. Have some more topo. Um, are you? Yes, we are going to be recording it. Ken, we are. Yes, we are. You can watch these these matchy matchy outfits anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> this was very coordinated for the video it's quality. True. I know. I was like beige or beige. How about some beige? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's ready to get started? <laughs> Everyone's virtually raising. Anybody ready to get started? Out of the hundreds of folks on here. <laughs> <laughs> South Houston, cool, super nasty. Okay, now they're ready, super ready, ready to go. All so right, ready. well then, let's jump into it. What's going on, Sumo Langs? For those of you, again, who don't know, I am Chris with the AppSumo team, and today we have a very awesome, special webinar guest. It is Kelly Stalker, <laughs> who is incredible. I'm going to give you guys a quick bio on her, and then we're going to dive into it. So, Kelly is a type A personality constantly wrestling with a procrastinator's brain. She works in web content and consulting and started a productivity side hustle after realizing that everyone from startups to big corporations struggle with digital overwhelm and the feeling that there is never enough time to get the big wins. And Kelly has been a friend of AppSumo for probably like two years, something like that. She's worked with us on a number of projects and she's also uh, come in and helped train some of the team on productivity. We did a productivity power hour with her about a year ago where she optimized our inboxes, showed us some of the coolest tools to be using to help getting everything flowing and creating a productivity system. Um, I am still very much using the system that Kelly helped me set up over a year ago. So we have a lot of awesome uh, material today to go through. But Kelly, <laughs> welcome. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> well, thanks. I like how Lisa is like, time's a wasting. Uh, I get it, Lisa. You're totally right. We will not waste time. Um, and we, by the way, will be optimizing your inboxes if you like at the end. So, so the thing that Chris forecasted, we'll definitely be doing. Um, so for me, I, I felt like I worked at Dell, which was, you know, big corporate America, lots of cubes. Then I worked at Yelp, like real startup hustle. And I thought like, oh, what's the same thing that's happening among all of my colleagues? Everyone feels like so overwhelmed by their inbox. Like it's just this constant, like constant sense of victimization with your digital tools. And I have a huge appetite for digital tools. I feel like I love the internet. We have a deep relationship in a way that's like probably a little bit excessive, but I just found myself recommending tools and productivity tips to folks. And I thought, well, like, why don't I just do this as a thing? And so anyway, the AppSumo team was kind enough to have me in and, and do a little beta testing on some of the things that I, uh, that I was doing at the time. And it seems like it worked. So um, we are here two years later and we're gonna do a lot of uh, interesting and awesome things. And it's gonna be so fast. So uh, don't click away. And that isn't like a clickbait thing. Just like don't click away because you're, you'll miss like three tools. So um, in the span of 10 seconds. So uh, I mean, feel like I should probably go ahead and kick this thing off with my yeah, deck. But, uh, okay, okay, two housekeeping pieces before we dive into it. One, yes, there will be a replay. So if anybody has to hop out early, 
I'll be sending that out later today. We'll also upload it to YouTube so you can watch it again there. Because as Kelly said, we're going to be going through a lot. We're going to be going through it quickly. So buckle up, get ready. If you miss anything, you can go back through it in the replay. Number two, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. It has the letters Q and A. If you click on that, you can ask all of your productivity questions there for Kelly. Um, if you have any now, feel free to throw them in there. Kelly will go through the presentation. At the end, we'll circle back on, on as many of those as we can get to. We got a lot of people on here today. So uh, Ken, I appreciate your energy and you're awesome. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we are gonna be trying to fly through this. It might go over an hour, so be prepared for that. Again, there will be a replay if anything's not applicable and we'll be optimizing your inbox. Get your questions in the Q&A. Okay, Kelly, let's do this. Okay, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Hopefully the share button works. Ah, all right, here we go. Webinar just crumbles right now. Yeah, do you see it? I'm muting my side right now. <laughs> okay, all right, up comes the presentation. What do you see? Is it good? Can everyone see it? Everyone got it? Yes. I, yes. I feel you, you're gonna have to pop out, but you'll get the, uh, you'll get the replay. Everyone can see it. All right, let's okay. do it. Sweet, all right, here we go, fire it up. Here's some things we're gonna talk about today, working around your brain because your brain is not to be trusted. We are gonna ditch distractions. We're gonna get time on our side. We are going to hack our inbox and then we're going to send some love to our robot helpers. For anybody out there, uh, all you sumo uh, you know how amazing and fabulous software can be and we're gonna talk about some that uh, is out there that's free, that's lovely um, at the very end. But I think like what you're really gonna love is the number four, hacking our inbox. So as we dig through all of the content around your brain and ditching distractions and, and techniques and you're like, okay, like I know some of these things, um, number four is the real special place. So we will definitely get that in within the hour. Get ready to workshop it, laptops up. Um, and, uh, and I will like change all of your Gmail life at that point. But before we get there, we are going to do number one. And that is working around your brain. All right, sorry, there's like a delay on my side for some reason. Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the things that we should know is that our brains are very much like old OG lizard brains, caveman brains. Most of us don't move towards our big goals because our brains crave immediate tasks execution. So for example, like when I have something to do, like putting together a slide deck for said productivity webinar, my house has never been so clean because my brain's like, let's go ahead and get this one task done. So one of our biggest things that we need to work on is governing our monkey mind. It's the way to hit big goals. So the first thing that we have to do is Big surprise, identify your big goals. That's for the product, for yourself, for your business. Um, and I, I feel like it's important also to make sure that like I've got for yourself in there because uh, we, you know, really enjoy working in our business and a lot of times that's intertwined with who we are, but make sure that as a call out, you've got some big goals for yourself as well. Um, we won't be talking about that much today, uh, but I just, I always feel like it's important to put it out there. Um, you will not reach your goals if you don't know what they are. It feels like common sense, but there are a lot of people out there floundering around just, you know, kind of like checking things off their task list without necessarily like understanding whether they actually tie to what they're doing in their business business. So the task, the thing that I do every day is this daily data dump. Um, if anybody out there is a Harry Potter fan, I think of it as like a pensive, like pull all that stuff out of your brain. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you're probably not as big of a nerd as I am. Um, but essentially my idea every single morning um, and during the day is to get everything out of my brain. At the end of the day, like your brain can really only manage four to seven items at a time if you're lucky. Most of us are on the four range. So you can test that out by going to the grocery store and trying to remember four to five things simultaneously instead of having a list and you'll come home with like nothing that you needed and like a can of diet coke and you know an, an issue of people so um so it's this really funny thing where we really can't hold things simultaneously so the best thing to do is exit them from your brain so um essentially what you find is that if you're trying to keep all those things at the same time you'll feel a lot of stress and, uh, and your brain doesn't have room to innovate. So my, the, the first thing to do every day, and as you can, is write everything down. Um, I have different lists. I have a to-do list for work. I have that to-do list for personal. And then of course I have like random innovations ideas. I'm guessing everyone on this call probably has a lot of those. And so making sure you've got your million dollar idea list available at all times is really critical. I use the most important task method, and you may have heard of this before, but essentially I am taking a look at that big daily data dump, and then I'm moving evaluating it against a couple things. Like number one, does it tie to my big goal? If it doesn't, shouldn't be on there. How much time does it take? Like understanding like how, like how much of your day you're going to need to dedicate it to it and dedicate to it. And then 
if you alone have the skill set to do it. Um, and that's just kind of a nod to making sure that you're delegating anything that doesn't need your big brain. Um, at the end of the day, what you want to look at for the most important task method is the importance or value add plus the urgency. And that helps set your prioritization. It's also important to note that importance is not Urgency, urgency is a place when you're in reactive mode. So, um, so a lot of times you'll feel like something is really urgent because someone is requesting it from you. But if you take a step back and, and understand like, all right, is this actually important to my big goal or is this important to somebody else? Um, that can help you delineate between uh, urgency and importance. So once you understand uh, whether something's important and or urgent, then this is your task order. So of course, anything that's important and urgent goes first. Important but not urgent is second, which may seem counterintuitive, um, but important and not urgent means that like it never gets to urgency, which is helpful to get ahead of the game. Not important and urgent are often things that are interruptions. Uh, so they feel very urgent because like someone again is like kind of knocking on your door, but if they're not important, don't address them until, you know, like essentially like the tertiary uh, priority level. And then not important and not urgent are time wasters. That's what I'm talking about earlier when you find yourself like cleaning the house or running an errand that you don't have to do or you know playing around on Facebook to figure out like some zany little thing those things like the very bottom of your list and only when you have the luxury of an amazing amount of time um, but typically like I just exit anything that's in the fourth category and go back to the first and the second so once you're looking at your most important task list, it can be kind of difficult to, especially if you're a solopreneur, like really get a sense of what your priorities are. So here are some additional ways to do that. Number one, ask for help. Um, a lot of times having a second person talk through what your priority list looks like uh, can lend perspective. So they can challenge you where you need to be challenged. They can say like, okay, so you think this is important, but you know, let's think about the nuances of this and like, and can we make it more specific? So asking for help from either a colleague, a boss, or somebody that you consider as some a mentor or someone at your same level um, make sure that when you're approaching your priority list you're out of your reactive and people pleaser space so uh, we all not I mean I say we all but most people have a tendency to feel like oh you know I've got this request from a client or I have this request from a boss or or there's somebody in my world that needs something from me this is where we're getting into urgency think about it and and, and really understand like, all right, am I people pleasing? Is this urgency being set by somebody else? Or can I like, can I remove myself from that scenario and understand like how it ties directly to my big goal and not theirs? And then I, I feel like for me, a real clarifying question that I can approach my to-do list with is if I had to stop work today after one task, what would it be? And so once you identify that one task, you do that one task and then you go back to your to-do list and you say, all right, now if I had to stop work today, what would my task be? So everybody's got a different way of approaching their priority list. I feel like it's, it's, you've got the kind of like objective algorithm of importance plus urgency that can help you pull things out of that daily data dump. And then you have, if you need additional clarification, you have questions like this and people that can help you. Uh, all right. So one of the things that has been really effective for me is Gretchen Rubin's motivational tendencies quiz. And it's one of those things where you're like, oh God, am I just taking one of these BuzzFeed quizzes? How annoying. That's not this. This essentially is the idea that there are four motivational types. This would have really helped me in college to know exactly what my motivational type was. I feel like uh, I would have actually, you know, done better and or gotten things done, like papers in on time instead of the day after. But there are essentially four motivational types. There's an upholder that just wants to know what should be done. That person can just add their stuff to the calendar and to their to-do list. There's a questioner who wants a justification, so you always need to know the why. Um, and so in, in order to actually accomplish the task, you're gonna need to know your why so that you can be fired up to do it. There's the obliger, like me, who needs accountability, so I'm always gonna need somebody to give me a deadline. And that's when you hire or ask for a partner. And then rebels want the freedom to do things their own way. And so you need to ask for, or ask a boss or whomever is like setting your priorities or give yourself creative license within that task. So what I found is by understanding my motivational tendency, I can approach my to-do list with a measure of efficacy that I couldn't previously. So if you're an upholder, you're like to-do list, nailed it, no problem. But if you're any one of these other types, then you have to frame your to-do list within the way that you would actually be motivated to get things done. And so once you have established your motivational type, looked at your to-do list, figured out your most important tasks every day, and then also understood exactly, oh, I got like a poll. Oh, I see. Chris, did you set up a poll? Oh, that was me. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> You're so productive right now. You want to get some. Um, then, 
Right, I know. And then you have to understand like what tool you want to use. So for me, I've used Todoist. I love Todoist. It integrates with a lot of things. Like if you're using Zapier, if you're using IFTTT, um, Google Tasks and Google Keep is kind of what I've switched to just because it's integrated so seamlessly with Gmail and my entire environment is a Google ecosystem. Um, things is one that you can pay for. It's really effective, but it's also one of those things where you're like, ah, do I need to spend more money if I already have a to-do list? Um, but things is really delightful if you feel like you've got a little extra cash. Uh, Evernote, of course, and then on paper if you're a paper person. The key is that you always have the capacity to add something to that to-do list. So if you're a paper person, um, you're, you know, drag around that notebook all the time. But for the rest of us, like with a digital, a digital uh, tool, just make sure that it's always at the ready and that you're consistently like exiting things from your brain to create space and also to help create priority in the future. So lesson number two, your brain loves a good ping. So we are designed to be distracted. Um, we're designed to pay attention to distractions. And so I think of them as distractions. And essentially, at the end of the day, all the tech that we're using is designed to be distracting, which is not a new concept. We've known this forever. But what I thought was really interesting is when I was doing research about distractions, I found that an average distraction time is 26 minutes, which seems like insane considering you're probably trying to work, you know, between eight and 12 hours a day. Like 30 minutes as an average distraction time is unacceptable. So how do we get rid of those? Um, well, as it turns out, you can turn off all of your notifications. We get 67 plus notifications a day, and I would imagine that's on the low end, um, especially for anybody that's like trying out new apps or hacks or wants to like test a tool for their business. So at the end of the day, like knowing that your brain is looking for distractions um, is like critical to understanding how to guard against them. So the first thing is setting your scene. So uh, when if you work from home if you work from a coffee shop if you work in an office like taking around taking a look at your workspace and understanding like all right what is typically distracting me is there like a little thing on my desktop that's bothering me do i have a stack of papers are if things messy does messiness even bother me maybe it doesn't but just evaluating what your workspace looks like and making it optimal for non-distraction so if you're at home, make it neat, have a reasonable screen size. Uh, I, I feel like a second or a third screen can change your life. Um, if you can close a door, can, can you close the door? Can you set a system with your family so that they know if the door is closed that they're not coming in? If you're a nomad, can you create consistencies within your workspace? So for me, I work a lot from coffee shops and, um, and because I, I just need the, the ambiance and the noise and I need to like not be around all the tasks that I can do at home. And so I create consistencies every single time I go to a coffee shop. Like I've got my, my water glass, I've got my headphones in, I've got my same music playing, I've got my laptop set up the same way. So creating consistencies even within chaos, uh, I think is really important for setting your scene, even if you're a digital nomad. And this could be when you're like hanging out in Bali or you're on the beach in Belize or you're just in the Starbucks. Um, all right, so in addition to ditching those distractions that can be environmental, there are obviously other digital distractions that you can turn off. So turn off any non-business critical notifications that is phone, web, watch, or whatever. If it's flying in, you block it. And, um, and my kind of strategy for this is like, turn them all off other than anything that's like business critical. So I usually leave text on, I'll leave my phone on, I'll leave Slack on if like, if I'm working with a client that has Slack, um, and I, and, and I don't leave email on and, uh, any, like anything that feels in my calendar, of course, but everything else is off. For some reason, I find myself like consistently having to go to an app to open it, to find the thing, uh, whatever that looks like. Uh, if you, for example, are doing a lot of things on social and like, you just can't live with that. Like you want to be super responsive to your social customers and you just can't live without those Instagram notifications. All right, fine, turn them on. But business critical is the name of the game um, when it comes to your notifications. And it's really easy to do with your iPhone. You can do it straight from screen time with your Android. You can do it straight from the notification panel on Chrome and on Macs. You can do it like right up in the right hand corner to say like, please do not fly this stuff in. I'm trying to work. Hey, thanks. Uh, I also turn off badges and tab numbers. So um, within Gmail, if you're using Gmail, I'm assuming a lot of you are using Gmail during this um, during this presentation. So if you're not, then uh, we can always talk later after this and, and figure out how to how to do it in, in whatever system it is. But turn off any of your tab notifications. Like do you have an unread email icon count at the top? Like turn that off, and also turn off your badges um, if you can stand it on your 
phone. In fact, like the reason that badges, part of the reason that badges are red on our phones is to essentially like activate the emergency center in our brains. So if you ever look at your email, I mean, look at your phone and you're like, oh, I have 12,000 emails. Like, why am I so stressed out by that? Well, not only because you have 12,000 emails, but also because it's bright red and it's like, alert, alert, like there's some terrible thing happening. Um, the thing that I would also recommend is that you detab your life. There are so many times when I'm doing productivity coaching and somebody pulls up Chrome and they've got like a thousand tabs open. And number one, like their computer is moving at the speed of a glacier because that's really, because, because Chrome sees that as, you know, several, your computer sees that as several instances of a, of a program running. But secondly, like your brain is always having to figure out like, okay, what tab do I go to? What tab is important? And so there are a couple tools that I recommend. One is tab snooze. And Tab Snooze does exactly what it sounds like. You can actually right click on the tab and say like, bring this back to me later. Um, you can also have it bring it back to you on the regular. So for example, like say you've got your credit card bill open and you're like, I want this tab to pop up on the fifth of every month. Like you can have that happen. If you say, oh, I really wanna like check this, you know, site out or this hack out later, you can say like, just give it to me at some random time tomorrow and it'll do that as well. Um, and I also like a tool called OneTab. OneTab will essentially take all of the tabs that you have open and then just put them in a list. So you're only looking at one tab, but you don't have the anxiety of not having that, like the tab isn't open, but you don't have the anxiety of losing the tab. So one tab has been a total lifesaver for me and, uh, and, and certainly something that has like helped me from being, that helped me, kept me from being distracted among my tabs. If you are not to be trusted, get a digital parent. These are so easy to come by. Chrome, you can use stay focused where you can either block yourself entirely from a site or you can block it for a certain time. So like, hey, don't let me get on Facebook until after 5 p.m. Uh, for Chrome and Android, that will sync across uh, both platforms. You can use BlockSite. Um, and BlockSite's pretty robust. I would actually dig through all the features and figure out what works best for you. But you know, at its heart, it's a site blocker, but it, there are a, a ton of other features that you can use um, as well. And I love the fact that it syncs. Um, with Mac, you can, with, as a Mac app, you can block yourself entirely from sites and set timers using self-control. And then I really love this, uh, this little, it's like a plugin and also an app. It's called Mindful Browsing. And it's basically like this gentle little note that's like, hey, um, you've been on this site for like 25 minutes. So um, are you sure you want to be on it? And I just, I it's just like a little like tap on the shoulder. So that one's called Mindful Browsing. And you, as you can see, these are all linked. And also I want to tell you that if you want this deck afterward, um, there's a forum and you can just request it from me. And these are all linked out so you don't have to go like discover them on your own. Um, and then of course you can always just go offline within Gmail and Google Docs, super easy. Uh, there are plugins for that and you can also just choose Gmail offline. So if you wanna be playing in your Google Docs or if you wanna be playing in your Gmail and you don't want the temptation of being connected to the internets, uh, going offline is a super simple option. All right, how's everyone doing? I, I'm not even, I can't see the question. So Chris, tell me if I'm missing anything. No, Chris? No, you, are, you are killing it, yeah. Okay, I'm just like powering through. So somebody needs yeah, me to slow yeah. down or they have questions or suggestions, you have to tell me. Yeah, um, just recommendations on different tools that, that people use, which is great. Let us know in the comments what, what other tools you guys are using for, for yeah. the same stuff or for different things. It's, it's great to see. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not under any illusion that I know the entirety of the internet. So please tell me. Uh, of course, if you have an Android or an iPhone, you've probably used these, but I was just like to flag it for you. You know, they've got built in tools obviously now with screen time and digital well being where you can manage the notifications, limit your app usage, choose wind down and do not disturb. If you're like me, it kind of like popped up on my phone and I was like, ah, like I'll look at that later, but I haven't utilized it as effectively as I think I should have. And so, you know, putting a reminder on your calendar to say like, all right, you know what, I'm gonna take five minutes away from endless scroll on Instagram and understand like exactly where I'm spending my time on my phone. Uh, can be really helpful and effective. I love the wind down feature. Uh, it just really, it reminds me that it's midnight and that it's like probably time to go to sleep and it exits the blue light. And it just makes it so much more of a like signal for my brain to go to sleep. Um, so if you're looking at any of these things, even if you don't feel like limiting app usage or whatever, like definitely check into the wind down option just as a like peace of mind uh, tool. So something I like to point out, which you probably know, but I think has been really effective for me is that color is a neurostimulant 
and you have the option to grayscale both your phone and your computer. Uh, I found myself like on vacation, having a lovely time and then scrolling through somebody else's Instagram going, oh my gosh, but they're at that concert. Oh, but what about these cute, like first day of school kid photos or blah, 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 blah. Like all of these things where I was like distracted and not present in the moment. And I realized that by grayscaling my phone, um, it immediately becomes, it's not a game anymore. It's a tool. And so it's super easy to do no matter what phone you have, but you can also do it on Mac, PC, um, Android, and iPhone. Those things, like those links right there will link out to exactly how to do it. But once you, I, I really suggest that you try this because like you'll find that the moment your phone goes grayscale, you almost feel like your brain relaxing. Like somehow the like the, the claws have come out of your brain and you're like, oh, I just, I don't even like, I don't even want to look at this phone other than to use it as a tool to email back and forth. Um, I will say I did that about a year ago for a long time and it really does have a crazy impact. I heard Whitney Cummings say it on, on a podcast that she did it. I'm like, let's try that out. And it's, it's super cool. You really do notice the addiction just like being peeled away when you switch it over. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm not one of those that's like, oh, like, I, you know, we're all getting like crazy hacked and like wearing a foil hat and all that stuff. But like at the end of the day, like at that moment of like putting it into grayscale and realizing just like how much my brain was craving the like Skittles colors of the phone was a real, it was, a, it was a big revelation for me for sure. So, so I have my phone on grayscale during the day when I'm trying not to be distracted. I put my phone on grayscale when I'm on vacation. Um, and I put my phone on grayscale when I find myself like getting caught in uh, infinite scroll, um, which happens way too easily. Um, you are not going to want to scroll through 700 photos of people's dogs in black and white. It's like not Ansel Adams. It just looks terrible. So um, the other thing is, I mean, we're talking about a lot of digital time sucks, but also reducing in real life time sucks, I feel like is, is critical and it's something we don't think about as much. So one of the things that I did that I thought was really, was really effective for me as somebody who works from home is identifying my biggest distractions as they happen. So kind of even taking a second just to note like, somebody came in the room and like, you know, this thing pinged and this timer went off and like this phone call came in and understanding like what is actually happening in my day to day that's pulling me away from being able to focus. And then understanding like, okay, which of these can I solve and which of these can't I solve? So this is, you know, kind of the close the door solution. Like, do I have my headphones in so I'm not distracted by the neighbor's dog barking? Um, and, and, and really figuring out like all of those little things that your brain is trying to make you pay attention to uh, and, then, and then exiting them as much as possible. Um, just the, the idea is I always think of as just like put on your blinders uh, so that you don't have these like things happening in your peripheral vision. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you to do is to stop filling up every minute of the time that you reclaim. Um, so for me, I find that like I, whenever I have like a spare minute, say I get it from my computer and I'm going to go get water, then like I automatically put on a podcast or I automatically put on an audiobook. And it, instead of letting my brain A, relax or B, work through a problem, I'm constantly stimulating it in that way. And so, um, so it's not necessarily a time suck, but it is like kind of a time waster in that way. Like I could be making strides on a program, on a, on a problem, but instead I'm like, you know, listening to Akimbo or like revisionist history or something like that, which are super fascinating, but maybe better left for time when I really want to be like, really want to concentrate on entertainment. And, um, and then I, I would also encourage you to set a timer for home tasks and errands. And we'll talk about some timer based productivity later, but I find that like a, a task can take as much time as you give it. So I'll be like, oh, I'm going to clean up my desk. And then, you know, an hour later, I've gone through all the pens and made sure they all worked. Like, was that helpful for the middle of my day? It was not helpful for the middle of my day. So setting a timer and saying like, all right, I'm in a lot like 10 minutes to do this one thing at home because it feels like it has to get done. And then like, and sticking, staying true to like when that beep goes off, you're back at your computer. Um, and then I, I, I feel like delegate nonsense is probably a like really informal way of just being like, there are things that you don't have to do. And in honor of this productivity seminar, I asked, you know, my Facebook crew and was like, what's like something you've done that's really enhanced your productivity? And I thought it was really funny that somebody responded and said like, well, I have three dogs and like, I'm constantly having to sweep away tumbleweeds of hair. And I just finally broke down and got a Roomba and it's like changed my life and it saved me like X number of, uh, you know, hours in the day or hours in the week. And so, you know, looking around and understanding like, what are these tasks that I feel have to get done? And is there somebody else that can do it? Or can I just get a machine to do it? 
So um, I want to stop for a second, see, Chris, are there any questions? Are there any suggestions that we want to throw out there? No, no, it's going well. We got uh, people like Flux or Flux, I guess, uh, for, for lowering the screen, um, which is something that, that I've used in the past as well that I really like. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely down for the people like the idea of having a wind down option, which is, which is super cool. Um, and yeah, if people want to know how they can get the slide deck as well uh, when, after, the, after the presentation. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. And, and just so you know, there's now a built-in function. If you have a Mac, there's a built-in function to, that's like Flux. Like I used Flux for a long time and I loved it. Um, and, but now there's a built-in function. I think it's under, it's under display preferences on your Mac and it may actually just, they may have just actually, uh, rolled it into a wind down function on your Mac as well. Um, I, but for, for PCs, like certainly <clears throat> I feel like Flux is probably the, is probably the, the way to go unless they've made some additional, you know, changes to, to Windows 10. So um, lesson number three, monotasking equals doing more and less time. So if you're like me and well, I mean, you can probably tell, but I like grew up in the eighties and nineties and they're like, everything was like, I'm a great multitasker. And that was like the top of every resume. Oh, but I'm such a good multitasker. Well, you know, it's multitasking has kind of become a dirty word. And, um, and it's like, no, are you, but can you single task, but can you monotask? And what struck me as difficult about that when I was working in my capacity at Dell and at Yelp, where my job was super broad, I was like, how can I possibly single task if my job is like, you know, a thousand different things every day. But I, I think what we figured out is the answer to this is that you do multiple iterations of single tasking. So, um, so really focusing in on one task at a time increases the quality of the work that you do with that task, uh, but doesn't necessarily preclude you from doing multiple tasks in a day and shouldn't is my, by the way, either. So um, the other thing that I really like about single tasking or monotasking is that it, help, it helps rebuild your focus. You know, if you're at the gym and you lift like a weight with your right arm and then you like lift away with your left arm and then you like go do a leg and another leg and then like maybe a crunch, like you're not actually building the muscle. You're just like being, it, like you're just doing a distracted circuit essentially. So if you think about that, it, it, like in regard to how you approach tasks, um, if you single task, it helps rebuild your focus because you actually have to sit down and work through a complex problem and, and build that kind of like sense of focus again. And like, it's going to be tricky at first if you're not somebody who's used to single tasking and it's going to feel really foreign and it's almost a little bit uncomfortable because you're like, oh God, I actually have to sit here and figure this out. I can't just push it off into, you know, never, never land while I do something else that's distracting. But, um, but you'll, you know, find that, that you, your brain will will fall in line quickly. Um, I think also it, it helps you manage time better because you have a sense of how much time you're spending on each thing. It's not just like, oh, I don't know, I did maybe half of 14 tasks in uh, the last five hours. And I also find that it really helps me improve my, the, the, just the quality of my output. And, and I guess it's, it's not a surprise, it's pretty obvious, but for me, I've discovered that if I'm doing anything else, like even in average everyday life, for example, like I'm listening to a podcast, but I'm also like trying to get out the door to go, you know, do a bunch of errands. Like I will have, I will leave something at home or I will forget to lock the door or I won't know if I lock the door. And it's because my brain is occupied by something else. And so like, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you always have to single task everything in your life, but noticing like a marked decline in the quality of like my memory or my capacity for like conscious and, and thoughtful, you know, action um, has certainly really made me a devotee of single tasking. Um, and not, not last, but also not least, you avoid switching costs. And switching costs is this interesting concept. It's essentially like kind of what you experience when you're like talking on the phone or responding to email. And you're probably not doing either very well. You can also see switching costs when you do your ABCs and one, two, threes. By that I mean, I can say A, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, five really easily, obviously, because like, you know, our, my brain's like letters and numbers. But if you start trying to do A1, B2, C3, like there ends up being a lag because your brain is like trying to switch back and forth. And so that mental lag 
bag creates like not only a, a time suck, but it also degrades your focus. And it's also why you're exhausted at the end of the day. Because if you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna do PowerPoint. Oh, I've gotta go to calendar. Oh, I've gotta go to Gmail. Oh, like I need to have this phone call. Then you're experiencing that mental lag in between. And you're asking your brain to essentially like run like zigzags. Uh, and so, and it just like, if you feel exhausted at the end of the day, like maybe take a look at your switching costs, which is why monotasking will help. So we are going to talk about this technique. It's called the Pomodoro technique. Um, some of you guys may have used it in the past and it is essentially a timer based, uh, productivity, single tasking technique. You are going to use a timer to break work down into intervals. It's typically 25 minutes of work with a five minute break. And this is how it goes. You take that to-do list that you totally optimized at the beginning of the day. You decide on the task, you set your timer, you work on the task, you end the work and you take that break. And my preference is that you try to go screen free for that five minutes, um, just to give your brain a break from being so stimulated. Um, if you can't go screen free, it's fine. But, um, but what happens is that for whatever reason, 25 minutes feels like something that, like a, a amount of time that you can actually take to the exclusion of all other distractions. So a phone call comes in, you don't take the phone call. Like a text comes in, you don't check the text. An email comes in, you don't check the email. You are doing the thing that you are doing for 25 minutes and it's only 25 minutes. So at the end of that, you're like, all right, like I will go figure out who is trying to frantically get a hold of me with all of these digital pings. Um, but what's really great about it is that you are giving yourself the, the opportunity to think deeply about that thing that you're doing, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I, I'm maybe making too much of it because like, you can also do, say, for example, you could set your Pomodoro timer and do like, dig through my email, or you could do your Pomodoro timer and be like, do all my invoices. Um, there's a, the opportunity within that 25 minutes to do something that isn't necessarily like a true single task, but it is a true single function. And this is why it works. It trains your brain to focus on one item for short periods of time. It allows for your brain to just chill for a second with five minutes. So you're not just constantly feeling like go, 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 hamster on the wheel. It sets expectations to the work and the time you'll need. So you can say like, oh, I know that like between, you know, eight and 10, I'm gonna do like four, four Pomodoro like uh, revolutions. Um, and it also gives your brain the routine it craves. So your brain, as, as a OG lizard brain is always looking for a way to latch onto a routine. And so Pomodoro can help that. So if we're like hearkening back to earlier when I'm saying like set the scene and like, you know, signal your brain and give it this sense of like, this is work time now, that this is exactly like how you can do that in a really easy way. Um, here are some apps that you can use, Be Focused, Focus Booster and Tomato Timer. Um, all of those are super easy plugins. You can also use your phone. There's tons of apps for it. And a lot of them will also integrate. So for example, there is a Pomodoro timer called Pomo Done that will integrate with, uh, with your Todoist. So you can put everything in your to-do list, start pumping it on, and then start digging through tasks. Here's lesson number four. The uh, powerful remind routine and reward uh, habit loop forming um, philosophy. So if you've read Atomic Habits or you've ever heard of the habit loop, these are essentially how you create a habit. Um, if you have good habits, you get more stuff done, you get more stuff done. Yay. Everyone's super excited. You make more money. Your product is better. So the reminder is the trigger that, uh, initiates the desired action. Your routine is the actual behavior you perform and the reward is the reinforcement or the benefit from doing this behavior. Your brain is like, please give me this structure and I will do what you want. Um, and so it's also, so the very beginning, the reminder is also known as an acute a cure prompt. And your brain essentially needs this to like kind of signal that it's work time um, or that it's home time or that it's sleep time. So remind your brain. Um, this is when you like sit down you put your headphones in, you have your cup of coffee, you fire up your first Pomodoro revolution and uh, you open your email or you open the project that you're working on. You do the routine, whatever that looks like. You can go through your to-do list. You can set your, you know, your uh, most important task list, um, and then start powering through those like must-do projects. And then you reward the brain, and you can with the pat on the back, like, "Hey, I did an awesome job! Yay! I'm so excited!" You can go for a walk, get a coffee, do some mindless scroll, whatever. But just acknowledge that you have done this kind of R plus R plus R and reward the brain in some small way. And then the next time you sit down at your desk, turn on the Pomodoro, put in your headphones, your brain's like, I get this. I know what we're doing now. I'm super into this and I'm going to work for you. 
Decisions, essentially, in my opinion, are the enemy of that routine, um, which is the, such a critical part of forming like good habits and, and being productive. Um, in general, as we know, our brains get decision fatigue. And so I always advocate for cutting corners where you can. This isn't always a thing that's possible depending on your work environment, but here are some decisions that I think are pretty easy to streamline. Um, certainly the same wardrobe. So if you're, you know, you don't necessarily have to take the, like I wear jeans and a hoodie every day approach. But if you, for example, like if, like, if you are a person that has like an enormous wardrobe and you know that you're really only wearing, you know, 40% of it every single day, then take the extra 60% and put that off to the side because essentially, and it doesn't have to be like in a different closet, but just put it off to the side. And that limits the number of decisions you have to make it, you know, again, not jeans and a hoodie, but you know, you only have to decide between like your three different suit colors, uh, order or make the same meals on average, apparently, according to the internet where everything is true, uh, we make 226 decisions per day about food, which is insane. Um, and so can you limit those decisions during your breakfast and your lunch and maybe your beverage choice? Uh, and then like, you know, go crazy at dinner or something. Um, and then think about the products that you use. So for me, I get in the shower and I'm like, oh, I have 17 shampoos. Which one should I use today? That may not be the issue for everyone. But if you do have a lot of products or a lot of things that you're having to make decisions between on average, can you do, like, can you decrease the number of products that you use and decrease the number of decisions? And, you know, like I said, a lot of these are little hacks. Like this isn't necessarily going to like, you know, you're going to wake up tomorrow and be like, thank God I like stopped making one, you know, extra decision every day. But by doing these kinds of things and cutting out small decisions, then you free your brain up to help make bigger decisions and not feel so exhausted at the end of the day. All right, lesson number five. I know I'm going really fast, guys, and don't worry, you can get this at the end, I promise. Um, I feel like people are a victim of their calendars. Oh, I gotta do what my calendar says. Well, as it turns out, like you kind of set your calendar, so in theory, so yes, certainly you have to do what your calendar says, but like maybe it's also time to take a step back and look at it and be conscious around it. Um, I think this is, you know, just kind of a, a, a easy framework and it's, you know, the stop start, uh, stop, start, continue, but stop before agreeing. We, in some way, a lot of us are people pleasers and we'll be like, of course you can pick my brain or of course I have an hour for coffee. Can it be a phone call? Can this be a shorter meeting? Can it be an email? Um, I think at the end of the day, like just giving yourself the this, this second to make the decision instead of automatically accepting the invite or automatically saying like, yes, this makes sense for both of us. Giving people the opportunity to like, to not only have a little bit of their time back, but also like being really conscious of your time um, is critical. So I find that, you know, people will say, hey, I would love to take you out for a coffee and pick your brain. And I'm like, I'm happy to give you the benefit of some advice for 10 minutes on a phone call. And they feel relieved that I'm not taking up 50 extra minutes of their time. And I'm certainly relieved that I'm not having to sit at a coffee that I don't need and essentially like dole out free advice for an hour. So just stop before agreeing, think through like, do I even want to take this meeting? If I do want to take this meeting, can I minimize it? Always be minimizing. If you are somebody that has a lot of recurring meetings, start canceling those. Um, can they be canceled or can they be shortened? Like maybe the meeting has to happen, but you realize that like sitting down for 45 minutes every week with your boss, like isn't that productive because like you end up talking about, you know, random stuff. Like, can you, can you make it shorter? Can you create the like kind of imperative to get right to the agenda by making it shorter? So taking a look at your calendar, is this recurring meeting benefiting me? Can it be shorter? Can it be more effective? Um, at the end of the day, everybody wants their time back. And then something that's been really helpful for me and moving some of my goals forward is saving sacred time on my calendar. So on Thursday morning from eight to noon, essentially, I don't take any meetings. And, um, and, it, and it's not a new concept, but, but really holding to it and making it a, a super diligent practice of not allowing people to have that time um, is another way of signaling to my brain that like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna think about this big project on Thursday. And so when we were talking about like your to-do list, and if you've got that third to-do list that's like innovations or big ideas or things that you want to work on, like that's where that can live. Like I'm going to get to this on Thursday morning when I'm saving sacred time or when you're looking at your most important task lists that are important but not urgent, that's also where that can live. So, um, so just creating distraction-free, meeting-free time um, can really help you move things forward in big and small ways. It's really where you create value. All right. 
your calendar strategy. Not everyone needs this. Some people are already instinctively doing this. But for me, I like to time block based on, and not in the like aggressive kind of like big time blocking way, because I just find that like my, my world is a little bit too scattered for that, but I time block based on activity. So I'll do like all my phone calls together if I can. Um, I will time block based on location. If you're somebody that's like driving around a lot, doing like sales pitches or with different meetings. Um, and I will time block based on project because I feel like it helps me get like a better, like a more robust understanding of that project. If I'm like in the headspace around that project. So, um, so, uh, I, I will I will block all of my like North Austin meetings on Monday, all of my uh, South Austin meetings on Tuesday, as much as I can. Like this isn't always uh, it, it isn't always a perfect strategy, but but if I can do it, it helps me and it also saves me a lot of time because Austin traffic is the worst. Um, I think also there's a lot of talk about attention management right now, and, I, and you can deep dive into the subject if you want. But for me, the two critical questions are number one. When are you smartest? So for me, I'm really smartest at 10 a.m. And I'm also smart again in the evenings, unfortunately, uh, at like 10 p.m. And um, when do I need stimulation? So around 3 p.m., I'm like, oh, is it time for a nap yet? And because I work from home, that can be very tempting. So a lot of times I will schedule meetings when I need stimulation as an extrovert, like being able to have a conversation with somebody uh, will fire me up instead of like, you know, thinking, oh, hey, I'll probably just power through that nap time at 3 p.m. So understanding when you're smartest and when you need stimulation can also help you like be very strategic about your calendar. Here are a couple tools I like. I love assistant.to. It is a, um, I think it's specifically to Gmail. Sorry if anyone's using Outlook, I can find an, op an option for you. But assistant.to pops up your calendar. It allows you to choose the slot. So it, like, it shows you like when you're busy, you choose a couple of different slots and then it sends those slots to the other party. When the other party clicks on the slot that is useful for them, then it sends you both an invite, thus avoiding that like final step of having to be like, oh yeah, right. Like now I have to send them an invite after they've chosen a time. The other thing that's really helpful about tools like assistant.to is that you're telling somebody when you're available, it eliminates 50%, if not more of the back and forth of going like, oh wait, when are you available? Okay, Monday. Well, what about like Tuesday at three? Oh, Tuesday doesn't work. What about next Thursday? Oh my God. At that point, I am like, I don't even want to meet with you. Like this is exhausting. So set, using a tool like assistant.to or even if you don't feel comfortable installing tools or if you can't for some reason, just telling people when you're available is a really critical step. The other one that I like is Meeting Bird. And now with the new Gmail doc, um, it, that should say doc, D-O-C-K. Um, it's really helpful because it just lives on the right-hand side of your Gmail. And um, it can be, it can replace tools like Calendly. Um, and it can also replace like if you've got that Gmail meeting plugin uh, it can be really great. Plus it syncs with multiple calendars and it automatically does time zone for anyone that's got international colleagues. Oh, and if you're on zoom, like we are now, it's got like a zoom plugin. All right. Uh, I know that you probably heard this a thousand times, so I'm going to say it just like every productivity person ever, but your inbox is not your to-do list. And this is why it's because your inbox is a place where you're reacting to somebody else. Like that feels like a constant kind of theme in, in the produ productivity space. It's like, if you are reacting to what somebody else wants, um, unless that person is like your boss, um, then you are not creating, innovating, building, you're not creating value for your product or yourself or your company. And so I always like to do this little like inbox task list versus real task list comparison, you know, and you find yourself like responding to an email, responding to an email, responding to an email. And your real task list, if you were looking at your most important tasks, is that you need to create pitch messaging, that you need to follow up on that phone call from like last week, that you need to set team milestones. So the difference between this is market and certainly like sometimes you have to work in email, but that doesn't mean that it is the place where your to-dos live. And um, when we hack your inbox a little bit later, uh, that will be, we'll, we'll get out of that rut. Um, there's also a place and time for email. Limit your email checking time is not a revolutionary idea, but um, there's a tool I really like called Boomerang. Um, you guys may have used it before. It's free. There's an Outlook and a Gmail version, and you can choose to, to pause your inbox. So you can say like, don't give me any new emails for the next like hour, for the next two hours, whatever you want. And you can also set expect, I mean, uh, exceptions. So if like somebody as important as emailing and you want it to get through, they can. Um, but inbox pause is really critical and, um, and you can have that, you know, with there's, there's a inbox pause plugin specifically, or just the the whole boomerang suite, which I would recommend. Um, you know, our brains love the ping of a new email coming in. So just 
don't give it that option. Um, setting a response expectation, I think is, is uh, has been really helpful for me. If you are always the person that responds in 10 seconds, you're always gonna be the person that people come to in an emergency. And while that may feel very gratifying from a social capital perspective, like it's not great <laughs> in general. So if you, you know, decide like, I'm gonna wait and not respond to emails for 24 hours, cause like you have the luxury to do that, I'd highly encourage it. And um, it also sets like kind of behavioral expectations for colleagues and other people that need you. Um, you could also try an out of office if you like, if you feel comfortable doing this. I've had, I've, you know, emailed vendors before and they'll be like, hey, I just want to like set the expectation that, you know, this is a very busy email box and like I may not get back to you for 48 hours. And I'm like, oh, perfect. Thanks. Because then I'm not stewing and thinking like, is this person going to get back to me? Oh my gosh. And it also, again, like trains me not to be the person that's like, I'm going to email this inbox and assume that like, I'm going to have a response right away. And then the other thing that I would recommend if you don't do it already is set up a text expander or canned responses. So within Outlook and Gmail, you have essentially like a canned response um, option. The, the can uh, at Gmail, it's called something else. I mean, sorry, in Outlook, it's called something else. And I can, I'll, I'll add that to the deck, but basically you're just like setting up an email template. And so for somebody like me, I get a lot of like pitches for content or pitches for writing. And a lot of times I have to say like, I don't have an outlet for that or I'm not interested in writing about this. And so like I have a canned response that's just like click, click, done instead of dear so-and-so, thank you so much for your inquiry, blah, 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 blah. Now, a lot of folks are use like Google Docs or something for that, I would argue that that is even less efficient than using a canned response because you have to go like open the doc, copy, paste, paste it in, send it out. So if you can do a canned response or using a text expander, um, it will save you so many keystrokes. Um, I've got a text linked here and, um, and then, oh, the Outlook one is called Quick Parts and it's super easy and magical and you should never type anything twice if you can avoid it. All right. Uh, I know this is not news, but for some people it might be news. Email is actually a communication tool. So when you're looking at your email, are you communicating? Is this email useful or actionable? Am I moving something forward? You know, if you can get in the habit of thinking about this whenever you look at your email and being like, oh, do I really need to send this like one line, one line or thank you? Probably not. No one needs that email. Like, all right, I got it because that's how email works. Like it gets delivered. So is it useful? Is it actionable? Am I moving something forward? If the answer to those is no, don't send the email. Um, I always think like, can it be shorter? Brevity is beautiful. Nobody wants your long rambling email. And in fact, like it is counterproductive to the action you're trying to take. Put the ask in the first sentence, you know, like I want this from you. Also, here's all my justifications. Write a meaningful subject line. That's not a huge surprise, but I feel like when I dig through my inbox, like the things that get priority are the things that look in the subject line are indicating to my brain that like there is an action to be taken or it is like something that I can like uh, essentially attach to like a hey there or a or a about that thing or a follow up in the subject line is not actually helpful. Um, and keeping the message focused is is critical. You can you might find yourself like wanting to wander off and be like, oh hey, you know, hope you had a lovely weekend and like you know what about the weather out there? But really, what people want to know is like what you want from them and how they can move forward because everybody is drowning in email. And then last, include links or outside sources if you cite them. So if you are like, hey, like where are we on this like project doc? Blah 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 blah. Like. I always link that project doc. It just is like kind and it keeps that person from getting lost in like a click hole of distraction. So like, oh, I guess I should go to Google Drive and find that project doc. Oh, I can't find that project doc. Oh, but what about this doc? And then like they never get back to you. So make it easy for people to respond to you by attaching or linking or whatever the outside sources. All right. So we are, we've come to the promised land, the getting things done promised land. Um, and this is based on the, um, based on David Allen's getting things done. And it's essentially a way to hack your inbox into using like, uh, like native tools within Gmail and, um, and, and setting things into multiple inboxes. Let me show you before we get here. So I'm going to open up my inbox to you guys. It's so scary. Oh my God. Um, here we go. And I haven't sorted my inbox today. So you'll see exactly how this works. Okay. Everyone get ready. This is the, uh, the creme ready. and the creme. This is what you've all been waiting for. Get ready. This is, this uh, has changed my life. I know. The, the life changer. All right. So here is what my inbox looks like at the beginning of every day. Can you see it, Chris? I want to make sure I'm sharing the right screen. 
Yes. Yeah, I can, I can see it. Got your Gmail pulled up. So yeah, if everyone wants to get theirs pulled up as well, you're, yeah. uh, this is going to be no, no sitting back and being passive for this part. Yeah, this is the workshop. All right. So essentially, if you take a look at my Gmail, you might notice something's a little different. On the right hand side, I've got these inboxes and this is called multiple inboxes. Um, you may have used these in the past to create like like priority or social or promotion or whatever. Um, that's just kind of what comes natively within Gmail. But, um, but this is a very deliberate, like other choice to use multiple inboxes, which again is like just a function that at one point Gmail had as a lab, but now is like in there as just a, it's, it's under the advanced menu and, and we'll look at that. But essentially what I do at the beginning of every day is I look at this like hot mess express of an inbox and I go through and I just kind of think like, okay, which one do I want to keep? And I'm like, oh, somebody paid me. Amazing. Oh, that looks interesting. Mm, Chris, I'm definitely not starring anything from Chris. Yeah, just, just archive those immediately. Yeah, archive immediately. <laughs> um, I don't really know what this is. This is kind of like just instinctive from looking at my inbox in the past. Nope, nope, nope. All of this looks like just trash, trash, trash. Let me see. Oh, library notice. Of course I'm getting that. Um, all right. So those are the only things that look reasonable in my inbox right now. So I start them. I click select and then I archive all of them. Do to do. I know. And then I have no new mail. <laughs> and so you'll see if it, it'll, it'll, it'll render in a second, but like, you'll see that those came over here. So this like this essentially is my way of doing the David Allen get, getting things done method, which is do, delete, delegate, or defer. So the only things that I look at, like that I that I that I star in my inbox is something that I think needs additional attention. Um, at, so I and they may not need additional attention. It's just my instinct that they might. So um, basically, it works as if like you're going to your physical mailbox and then just before you go home, you're throwing everything out in the trash that you don't need that's right behind by the mailboxes. So you're not bringing that junk into your actual specific inboxes. Right. And it's, and, it, and so, it's, so the, the benefits of this are numerous, but one of the things that I love is that I always, I've touched everything in my inbox. Like I know where everything stands. Um, number one, number two, you're right. It means you're not bringing like the flyers and the garbage and the credit card offers like into your house. Um, and then number three, I have like a, a sense of my landscape at all times. So I know exactly what I need to look at. I know what I'm waiting for. I know who I've given something two and i've got the date on all of these things too so it's just a consistent reminder of like what the landscape of my inbox looks like and then number four it minimizes my inbox's importance in my life um which is like when we get out of that reactive space and we move into the brain space where you're actually creating building and iterating so if you want to do this with me i will go through this process right now and we're gonna go quick, but again, you can have this like webinar later and I can also like help coach you through it um, individually if you want. So if you've got your inbox up, this is Gmail specific. Again, like I have an Outlook uh, version, but we'll talk about that um, in the future. So the first thing you're gonna do is you will go to, oh wait, Chris, do you, can you see my presentation again or is it now my inbox still? Uh, I am seeing the presentation. Okay, good. Okay, so first things first, you are gonna open your Gmail and you will go to settings. Settings, uh, if you've got a regular old Gmail, is right here. You'll choose settings. And then you will go to advanced. Ooh. Under advanced, we're going to enable a couple of things. And the other things I'll kind of address at the end of this. But you'll enable canned responses, which we talked about a little bit earlier. You're going to enable multiple inboxes. And then you're going to disable this unread message icon. And then you're gonna click save changes. I'll give you a second to do that. All right. So then you're gonna refresh your Gmail and you will have this menu now, this multiple inboxes menu. So you're gonna click multiple inboxes and then you're going to add these search queries. So essentially you're telling the you're telling gmail like go look for these indicators that i will um at, that we'll add in just a second so i'm going to give you guys a second to do that and they have to be exactly this it cannot be 
like there can't be any spaces on the search queries. Now the panel titles can be different if you want. I suggest you go ahead and do the same ones that I do. Um, and then you can go in and change those later if you want. But has colon yellow dash star, has colon purple dash question, has colon orange dash guillemot, has green dash check, has blue dash info. Once you're done with that, go ahead and change your page size and also click right side of the inbox. And I'm just gonna give you guys a breather because I know that this is like a lot of the things. You have to type all this stuff. And once we're done setting this part up, um, we'll go ahead and refresh. We, we end up in settings like a lot during this process, but it's what I like about it is that you don't have to install a plugin, you don't have to have a skin, you don't have to like mess with anything. And, um, and, and at the end of the day, if you decide you want to back out of it, you just like, you can just turn off multiple inboxes and get back to your regularly scheduled programming. So I'm going to leave this up for just one more second. All right. How's everyone, how's everyone doing in there? You got it. It makes sense. You adjusting questions. Yes, there will be a replay. Replay will come. There will be a replay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Some people doing it right now. Yes. Awesome. I know. It's so great. I really like, I, I want to, I'd love to figure out a way to like send the text for these. Cause it's so annoying to sit there and type like has colon yellow. Star, yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah, it is annoying. But it, like you were saying, and I would advise people to do this too. Cause I was like, I don't know if I want these exact categories. Do I need a follow up and an awaiting versus just like active. I would just set it up the way Kelly has it right now. And then like she said, go back in and adjust it for what makes most sense for you. But even just try doing it with this system and then you'll kind of figure out what works, what doesn't. And then you can kind of adjust those tags then. Totally. And this, and the other thing that I love about this system is that you don't have to be like, you're not caught in the label trap, you know, like with Gmail, I feel like we all got super excited and started labeling all these things. And then there are all these like labels for everything. And then they're all nested on the left-hand side. And you're like, Oh my God, I'm never going to go look at these again. Like you don't have to mess with that. Never. All yeah. right, so I'm going to assume that like we're mostly done with this. So go ahead, make sure you've got your 20 conversations selected right side of the inbox, save changes. And then your Gmail should refresh or refresh your Gmail. All right. So then what we're going to do is go back to settings. I know you're really surprised. Go back to settings and then you're going to click general. Now under general, we're going to select a couple things. Number one, we are going to change your send cancellation period. If you did not know that you could undo send in Gmail, now you know. And um, if you didn't know you could change the time, well then you are welcome because 30 seconds is so much better than five seconds. <laughs> so much better. I love their new writing suggestions. What'd you say? No, you just only need that feature when you really need that feature. So oh, the yeah. more time, the better. I know, God, and you're like, ah, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that, so stupid. Um, I really like the new Smart Compose and uh, the personalization and the writing suggestions because it's terrifying, but also it like saves me a lot of time. It's basically like autocomplete for text. So anyway, uh, turn on Smart Compose if you want. Um, and then scroll down and you're gonna go ahead and drag these indicators into the in use. So what yours probably looks like is this. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull them over. So orange, purple, these are the ones that we indicated earlier with the has colon. This was one of my questions for you because I couldn't figure out how to do this and now oh, really? I know. <laughs> yeah. Now you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I prefer the symbols. Like for me, like for whatever reason in my brain, I'm like, oh, question mark means awaiting reply. Like the orange little forward dashes mean like I've delegated that to somebody. Um, so that's, that's kind of, but you could, I mean, you can, and you can choose and change the stars as you like. I just, for this time, we'll just set it up this way. Um, and then toggle keyboard shortcuts on. Some people are keyboard shortcut people. Some people aren't. Um, but I so try it because it has saved me so much time and go ahead and like, once you're done with that, click save changes. All right. Now we are going to configure your inbox. So go back to your inbox and uh, choose settings again. <laughs> and what you'll do this time though, is you're going to choose this option right here, configure inbox. Instead of going all the way to settings, you're just gonna click the gear and you're gonna 
Undeselect social promotions, updates, and forums. Now, I know that's gonna feel weird because I feel sure that those are catching a lot of like crap that you've been signed up for, but the but as you saw at the very beginning, all you have to do is like not stir them, and so it doesn't matter. Like this essentially solves your like constant unsubscribe problem. So once you've deselected all of those, click save. And the next thing you're gonna do is you're going to click that little gear again and then click display density. And you're gonna move it over to compact. And this just makes it look prettier. Um, and it also helps you see like the subject line and who's sending it to you and it will help you just in general. So um, it, to, to see exactly what you want. So click compact and click okay. And now your inbox should look like mine. And if there are any questions, like I know sometimes people don't see it move over to the right hand side. So I always like, I would just suggest you close your Gmail and then reopen it and see if that helps. Um, but, as I, oh, but as I mentioned, you will, did Chris, did you go away? Um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to, to, to talk to me at, like in the future about how to fix this if you need me to, and plus it's in the deck. So here is how you move forward. You're just gonna trust this process. Um, you do the task if it takes less than two minutes. You mark it if it requires thought work and you add it to uh, your to-do list. You delegate it, um, which is the little like forward, little orange guys, or and then at the end, you archive all. So how, what you're gonna do is you go through the first two, three pages of your Gmail using these stars. You then after you've like start everything that you think is important and that you want to move over to the right hand side in your multiple inboxes, then you select all of your Gmail and it's going to be like, do you sure you want to select 50,000 Gmails? And you're like, why? Yes, I would like to, sir. And then you click archive all and it all goes away. Hey, Colin. Let me see. I see you raise your hand, but I don't really know how to get over to that. Just a second. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me see. Could you go find all the emails you just archived? Yes, absolutely. So that's the point. That's kind of the reason that you archive and don't delete. Um, number one, like it's really difficult to fill up your Gmail unless you're getting like a ton of giant videos or attachments or whatever pictures. Um, and so they all just live in the archive forever. So because Google search is so robust, um, you can always go find it. And at the beginning I was kind of like, is my brain even going to like retain the things that I need to go find at any point? But it is, it's just super simple. As you know, like you just need like a quick keyword. So, um, yes, they live in your archive forever. And, uh, and you can always just like go back and say like, if I was like, oh, I want to find like another Venmo, blah, 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 then I find it and I can always just star it. And then when I start, it shows up over here on the right hand side. Now on your phones, you'll need to look under, instead of just looking under inbox, because your inbox is going to be blissfully empty, you will look under starred. Um, and so whenever I want to get rid of it, then I just unstar it. That's all I have to do. I just have to get rid of it right over here. Boop. And then it will go away when it refreshes. Uh, let me see. Does this work on Gmail and iPhone? Um, yeah, you'll just have to look under starred. The other things on the right hand side, what, I mean, the other thing that you'll do is once you respond to something, so say, for example, I was responding to this, I wouldn't respond to like the library notice, but if I did, I would say like, hey, thanks. I send the email and then I would change the star to reflect what I've done. So in this instance, I want to, if, if I'm awaiting a reply from someone, I would put the purple question mark. If I want to indicate that I've delegated it, I change it to the orange gillimit. And, um, and then that will automatically assign it to the multiple inbox on the right hand side. Um, in order to change the star, you're just clicking. So I'm not doing anything special. I'm just kind of like scrolling through. So I'm obviously not awaiting a reply from the Austin library, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave that like that. And then it'll show up down here on my awaiting reply as soon as my Gmail refreshes. Um, and, and as you can see, I've got delegated here. And then for me, I like to have a reference and a to read, like one that I want to check out later. Um, but yours can say whatever you want it to do. But the whole idea is that you get rid of that constant question in your brain around like, where is this like email in the grand scheme of my project? Or where is this email? Like, what's the action on this? You always know I'm awaiting 
I'm awaiting a reply. I'm awaiting an action from someone else. I've done it or I, it is gone out of my life. The other thing I want to point out is, and most of you guys have probably used this already, but we do have this handy little doc over here now with Gmail. So you can just pull things over. So as I'm looking at this like task list and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I really need to get back to this person. I would just pull it over right here. And then I can change the the thing to whatever I want my to-do list. So is this a most important task? No, but in this instance, I could say like reply to blah, blah with this information by 9, 12 or whatever. And so it's really great to be able to pull this over and then go ahead and unstar it out of my needs action because Namex isn't my to-do list. So I just like unstar it. And now I know that it's captured on my to-do list and it'll get done. So um, this is, it, it is gonna be really hard to click archive all, I promise. But I mean, the good news is like, it, you always know what's in your archive. All those emails are there. And the likelihood that you miss something that's important is pretty low. I mean, we've all been trained to recognize what emails are important. And this, this system just helps you prioritize them further. Um, the other things that we enabled are auto-completing text. So obviously auto-completing text. We enabled canned responses. So you don't have to have to reply, type the same reply again. We enabled keyboard shortcuts, um, which will save you a couple of seconds, but you'll feel like super savvy. And then we also enabled undo send. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that there is a function on quote new Gmail where you can snooze emails as well. So for me, like say for example, I don't really need to get back to this person until the beginning of September, or I feel like I can't take action on it, um, but I don't want it lingering on my to-do list. I can click snooze and then I can snooze it for this weekend. And then I would unstar it. So I'll snooze Chris here till later today. And then it unstar it. And essentially what will happen is Gmail will bring that back into your inbox and then you can choose what to do with it, whether it goes on your to-do list or if it goes into your task list. I mean, or rather in your uh, inbox. All right, so um, here are a couple keyboard shortcuts. I'm not gonna run through these because they're pretty easy, but I love just being in my inbox, like looking at an email and hitting R and like it opens up a reply. I don't have to like move my hand to the mouse, navigate it to the trackpad, navigate it to reply, you just hit R. If you wanna forward something, you hit F. Like if you want to toggle through your Gmails, you can do K and J back and forth. It's just, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't know. It feels like Gmail magic. Um, okay, we're getting to the end. And these are the apps and sites that I promised. Here are some of the ones I really love. I love brain.fm, which is neuroscience-based music. This is part of what I use for signaling. So for me, I have to have my headphones in and I cannot listen to anything with words. It's too distracting. Um, and what I like is that brain.fm takes it to the next level. So it's like optimized beats per minute for your brain to focus, sleep, relax, or meditate. And so as you choose those, um, and you can choose like the different hours or the time you want, and, um, and it's just been super effective for me. Uh, I also wanna point out that if you're like a nature sound person, oh, I have to plug in my computer. If you're like, a, like I have to go to sleep to wave noises, they have a feature for waves, wave noises that underneath the wave noises, there's also like, like a subtle beats per minute to help you sleep kind of magic. Um, Pocket is a place to aggregate all your articles that like all your super savvy friends and colleagues send you. And you're like, oh, I really need to read this, but I don't want to leave it up on a tab. But I also like don't want to put it in my bookmarks. So you can just like click add to Pocket and Pocket generates essentially like not only an aggregate of all those articles, but it makes it look like a cool kind of magazine spread and you can have it offline. So really great if you are somebody who has to like commute to work or something and you don't have access on the subway um, to the internet or if you are like on vacation you can have this like beautiful curated newsletter that you've kind of created for yourself of all the stuff you want to read um mm. speaking of reading uh i know that we are all being bombarded by a thousand personal development and self-help books all the time <laughs> for me, like i <clears throat> i look at them and i'm like Oh, right. I should read them. Why don't I just put that on my to-do list that will never get done? So I subscribe to Blinkist, which is basically like adult cliff notes for all the books that you are supposed to read. So you can be like, oh yeah, totally. Purple Cow, Let's Talk, or Atomic Habits. Got it. Nailed it. But like you don't actually have to read the whole book. It's uh, amazing. And it's also probably cheating, but I'm so down for that in my adult life. Uh, I love a, having a clipboard manager. If you're anybody who's having to toggle between screens or if you're having to like fill up forms or if you're just like a person who knows what it's like to go like, ah, oh, I can't believe I just copied over that like link that I meant to send. 
then Clipboard Manager will help you. It will keep all of your past clips. And this one, one clipboard will sync across devices. Um, I personally use Jump Cut for my Mac just because I've had it forever. But clip, one clipboard uh, has a lot of really great features um, and can be really helpful in avoiding that like dope moment. Send from Gmail is a Chrome plugin. Essentially, it like lives in your doc, or I guess it's probably an extension. It lives in your doc. And so if you're ever like, may say you're on a web page or you're on a product and you want to send it to your pal, like you don't have to go navigate to your Gmail and open a new Gmail and paste the link in and send it to them. You just click send from Gmail and it automatically captures that URL and it will send directly, you know, and then you just put in whoever you want to send it to. Um, and without having to go to your Gmail and get distracted. Um, mail track will track whether somebody's read your mail. It's also a Gmail plugin. You get like a check when it's sent and then you get a check check once it's read. Boomerang does some of that, um, but Boomerang also will let them know that you're tracking them, which is kind of a bummer. Um, if anybody's handling social, I mean, you are probably using like Hootsuite or, you know, or, or some kind of like, or later or some kind of like robust uh, social platform. Personally, I love Buffer and mostly it's because I can just like import my optimized schedule and then add to queue and it just like manages it. So for the beginning of the week, I essentially just add all the stuff to my queue and then it just manages it for me. And it's really simple. Like I don't need all of the like giant analytics and like, and the, the kind of like multi-stream things. Like I just want to be able to like send everything out, like schedule everything on Monday and like let it go for the week and not have to mess with it. So if that's true of your business or your personal brand as well, then Buffer can be really helpful. And it's free, I think for three to four profiles. And then um, last but not least, uh, I love Cloud App. It is like really been helpful for me. And, um, and it's a screenshot tool, but it also uploads to the web, but you can also do GIFs, but you can also do video if you're trying to record your screen. And, um, and it's just like super lightweight and I dig it. So, um, so those are a lot of, those are apps and sites that I recommend. Of course, like if anybody out there has one that they love, please send it over to me. Um, in addition to, of course, to all the other sites that I recommended throughout the presentation, like assistant.to and boomerang, et cetera. So if you are looking for additional reading, here are some of my suggestions. Um, uh, my first suggestion is you subscribe to Blinkist for 30 days for free. Um, and I do not work for them. It's just like, you know, easier to do that. Um, but here's like, if you want to say no and figure out like how to minimize stuff, read essentialism. If you want to get more done, read getting things done. Uh, this is like a little bit of a sleeper hit for me, but um, there's a book called 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Be Persuasive. Anyone that's doing sales, Anyone that wants to know about language or how you compel people to do things. Um, I love this book. It's old and it's a lot of thought experiments, but um, I'm, I thought it was really compelling. Uh, and then, of course, you have probably heard of Dare to Lead, Brene Brown. Digital Minimalism is a book that like was anathema to my being because, as you know, I love digital stuff. But it made a lot of sense to me, too. And then there is also a happiness course that has come out of Yale. It's totally free. It's six weeks. If you want to figure out how to maximize your happiness outside of all this hard work you're doing, you can take that well-being course. And it's pretty cool. So um, here is the link to request the deck. And, uh, and you can also just email me. Chris will probably send you my email. Um, if you want to book me to help figure out the Gmail, the Outlook, getting things done approach, or if you have any other questions, whatever. So Chris, what kind of questions do we have? I, I can probably like take the time to actually look at them now. Yeah. Um, people want you to catch your breath because you've been, you've been killing it for over an hour. Um, I think it's safe to say everybody loved this presentation. It was super cool. Got but a is it safe to say? <laughs> I think I think it's safe to say. Hey, I love this presentation. I was even, even able to go back in and kind of optimize optimize the system, which was cool. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but my internet died and I popped out and then came back in. So I lost some of the Q and A. Um, you might have oh. some. Of them. I have a couple of them, but for everybody watching, again, two things: replay will be sent out. So I know there's a ton of stuff in here that we went through. Um, so yeah, feel free to pop those questions in the Q&A box. We'll go through them there. Second thing, there's actually three things. I'm surprised there. Second thing, um, what was it? Yeah, get the Q&A, do the, uh, we will be sending out a replay. And Kelly, again, people are wondering where they're gonna be able to get this slide deck. So I think you said this link right here, bit.ly .ly or bit.ly slash sumo ATX. Yep. You can get it there. Um, but one of the questions I saw for the email inbox is when do you trash something versus archive it? Oh, I only archive and never trash. I never you like, I always just want to have the backup. Yeah. I'm the same yeah, way. I always want the backup. And also it's just like, whatever. I mean, it's the same difference, right? It's just out of my inbox. That's what I care about. Um, but I think also like I, you know, sometimes I, 
am wrong and I think I'm never going to need something again. And then I do. And so I think, well, well I should have just archived that. Um, and, and again, like, you know, Gmail search is so robust. Like you can do so many filters. You can do things like, you know, like find me important emails between like, you know, these dates or with this phrase or from this person or, and then you can, you can filter it so heavily that I don't ever really think you need to delete things. I agree. I feel you. Um, what was the other thing? How do you handle, so I've had the follow-up in the waiting reply. I've had both of those inboxes. One of the questions I kind of go back and forth on is like, are you just kind of using the awaiting reply as something that then you're going to bump up that you want to, in terms of like, sometimes I have stuff, a waiting reply, I'm waiting to hear back from them, but then figuring out when am I going to just like pop back in there and bump people? Do you use the reminders or, or how do you kind of structure what goes where? Yeah. I mean, for me, a waiting reply is a way for me to kind of visualize when, like when I asked that person for the, for the, you know, whatever I needed from them. And yeah, it's absolutely like a, a visual cue for me to say like, oh, like that person hasn't gotten back to me for 10 days. This is the time. And it also depends on the urgency of the issue, right? Like, so if I, like if I'm, this is really great if I'm pitching an editor for something or if I'm pitching content or like a, you know, web design or something like that. Like it's really helpful for me to know, okay, like that's more urgent than like if I'm responding to a pal about like, are we getting brunch? So for me, it's just really the visual cue that I'm awaiting reply. And I don't necessarily like always star everything I'm awaiting, awaiting a reply on. Like if, if it's something that like, it's okay if it goes by the wayside, it doesn't always get a question mark. Um, yeah. but, but what I'll do too, is that with, when I'm looking at it, like say at the beginning of the day and I'm like, oh, you know what? Like I'm actually awaiting a reply from this person and it's been long enough. I'll go ahead and just change the star to yellow. So it pops back up into my, like, I need to take a closer look at this box. I like that. That's cool. Um, all right. People want that link. So I'm going to type it out. It's bit.ly slash AppSumo ATX. AppSumo ATX. Yeah. And that's essentially just a form to request. Like I'm not signing you up for anything. Chris, I like, I was going back and forth about like, oh, do I do an ebook? Do I do like a learning link? Do I blah, blah, blah. But like we're bombarded with that crap like every single day. Like I'm not signing you up for anything. I just like only want to, you know, engage with the people who are, who, who need the engaging with. So when you, like when you, you'll, you'll ask, you can ask for the deck, you can ask for like a, a quick follow-up call, or you can ask like, Hey, is this something that you can do with my broader team? Or is there something personal that we can do, you know, with my, uh, with my inbox or with my digital landscape? Um, and that's like, just that form is just a really easy way to do that. And I'll get back with, with you guys this week. Um, and I really, really quickly, I know a lot of people, I didn't cover this at all, but like, I know a lot of people are looking for accountability around like not only what they're doing in their inbox and their projects and things like that, but just in general, like in life. And, and that's probably because you're a obliger type like I am. Um, and that is, you know, you have to kind of build in those accountability items. So like with deadlines or with people that you just can't break, break plans with. But I would also suggest there's a tool called Focusmate that's kind of cool. So you can essentially like, it just pops up a random person that also needs to focus and that person and you will be like on essentially like what looks kind of like a Skype call and, uh, and you're both just like, all right, we're here for 30 minutes and we're doing work. Um, I found that it's a much more effective for me than, be, than asking a friend to co-work with me or, um, or even trying to concentrate if I feel like I, my brain is like all over the place. Like that person holds you accountable to be sitting at your desk doing things. Um, but just so, so those instant, like do you book them and you immediately go into one or is it you schedule a time with someone? No, you're scheduling a time. You're scheduling. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. We got people in the comments saying that they're using it right now using focus mate. Cool. Are they, do they like it? Nice. I think so. Um, so what do you, uh, what are the tools that you're using like every day? Are there any like top major ones that you're always using or is it really just like that that whole list of ones you laid out are functioning you know, that's yeah um no i what i use a lot and i feel like i get a lot of great feedback about is the assistant.to the scheduling that has really yeah. changed how i do everything and like the tool itself is not very pretty and you you can you can accomplish that function with other you know calendar apps um as you like but but just like giving people, immediately giving them your availability is so like, they just feel like relieved, you know, because yeah. you look at your calendar, there's all these blank spaces and they like, 
but it could not, it, but it couldn't be like, and maybe it's not the same for them. And then you go back and forth and back and forth and it sucks. Like everybody is looking to minimize their, like what their inbox looks like. So assistant.to has been really, really helpful for me. Um, I personally don't like Calendly. A lot of people use Calendly, but I don't like it. It feels a little bit like of an affront personally to be like, oh, you want a meeting with me? Or like, um, here's my Calendly, go find it. I'm like, oh God, that's so annoying. And now I have to like go dig around in your calendar. Um, so assistant.to, yeah. I use every day. I use Boomerang every day. Um, the, the things that I didn't talk about with Boomerang, just because it's like such a robust tool, the one of the things I really like is that you can Boomerang something back to your inbox if they haven't like read it, if they haven't responded to it, um, if you, you know, it, like if, if it, um, let me see, or just, or just regardless, you can be like, just bring it back into my inbox whenever, like, because I just want to make sure that I'm looking at this and this is top of mind. So I actually use a waiting reply more like as the, as the kind of simple solution to that. But I mean, if you've got tons of emails going out and you don't want to have like a, you know, a thousand inbox of a waiting reply, Boomerang can be really helpful for that. Um, and again, that's for both uh, out Outlook and Gmail. So that can be really helpful. I use the Pomodoro technique every day. I use Todoist every day. Um, and I, like I also, and that mindful browsing has been really helpful for me too, because part of my job is like on the brand side is to be on, on Facebook or on Instagram or on whatever. And it is so easy to get down that rabbit hole. And I did see a hack. I can't remember who sent it to me. In fact, I saw a hack the other day. It was like, don't take your charger to the coffee shop because then you have to focus because you know your battery's going to run out. Something out like that, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe it was him, maybe it was him, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's kind of genius. Also, I would have like a panic. I would be so panicked. But um, yeah, right. yeah, but I, but I, I appreciate those things that like, I don't, like I shouldn't, I don't want to trust myself all the time to always be doing the right thing. Um, so like setting up some parameters like that in place are really helpful, but, um, but you know, the Pomodoro technique is one of those things that you think it sounds so silly, but I, I, as you know, Chris, I was just in Mexico for four weeks and working completely remotely and trying not to have monkey mind and trying not to be distracted by like the cool museums and like the fun events and all these things. And like, I, I didn't use the Pomodoro technique for like the first couple, like the first week and a half, I guess, cause I was just like all over the map. And I didn't get anything done. I mean, I was like a disaster. And so I finally, I sat down and I was like, all right, stalker, focus up. It's my last name, stalker. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, all right, Kelly, figure it out. So I put my headphones in and I turned on Pomodoro and I got more work done in like two days than I got done for the first 10 days. Cause I just, yeah. I, I had to signal my brain. I just like had to get used to it. So anyway, I highly there, encourage you to try it. There is something that's just like almost embarrassing about how simple we really are for things like that where it's just like, oh, I can't get anything done. But if I start a timer, then I'll be able to do it. Like I use this intermittent fasting app on my phone called Zero. if anyone's looking to, into that. Um, but it's literally just like a timer. Like if you click start fast and click end fast and then it alerts you. And I, when I'm getting overwhelmed with work or I just have too many things that I don't know where to start, it's like I make a list of things. I determine like how, how many Pomodoros it's gonna take. Almost everything takes less than one Pomodoro or something like that. And then I just put on Brain FM. I start, I have like a Gmail, um, like a, a Chrome extension for a Pomodoro timer. It yeah, just, yeah. It's just like, it's so simple, but it's like, if I can't get anything done any other way, if I just go into this very simple, straightforward protocol, it changes everything. And, and then you just get those big things out of the way. And you're like, why did that take me two weeks to do this when it took me 20 minutes to actually get it done? Yeah, I know you're right. But it's, it's just our lizard brain. Like I, I, yeah. Is, you know, I, I think I've told you the story before, but like I became convinced that our lizard brain is real when I went scuba diving and I like, I couldn't even, like I could barely snorkel at the very beginning of this lesson because like my brain was flashing red alerts. I knew all I had to do, like my conscious brain was like, all you have to do is lift your head out of the water. Like you're going to be fine if you're in like three feet of water. But my lizard brain was like, red alert, you're going to die. You can't breathe. And I thought, oh my gosh, like if it's controlling this behavior so strongly, like what else is it controlling? And so then that's when I started like digging into, you know, how like almost, you almost have to like coddle your brain like a, like a teenager and be like, all right, honey, like I'm going to ring the bell now, <laughs> like shake the treats for the cat. And the cat's like, oh my God, okay. Like, you know, it's just one of those things where you really almost have to coddle it. And, and it's all all about practice because you know all of this is great when you are when all when your environment is perfect and you don't have any chaos and you're like oh I am like I don't need this anymore because my environment's perfect but the moment you hit chaos if you haven't had practice then it all breaks down so it's like it's understanding how to use this in times of like 
in times of like perfect serenity and also in times of like, oh my God, everything is like crazy and I'm doing all these different things. Um, yeah, I will. Uh, so this is another thing I saw come up. Um, so in terms of physical notebooks, two of the ones that I've really liked is one is the best self journal, which I've used a lot. Uh, I've probably gone through like two or three of those in uh, over the course of the past years. I really like those because they're very like compact. You're very limited in what you can put in them. And I found that was easy to stay consistent with. Um, another one that I've been using recently, I've only used it for a couple days actually, is the Evo. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this one. I think it came out a year or so ago. But the way it works is you actually take an online test and it tells you like what personality you are, whether you're like, you're the architect or you're the oracle or you're the explorer. And then depending on which one, they have like four different journals based on those like types of productivity, like how you get things done. So that wow. could be another thing for people to check out. But my question for you is uh, what is the like data dump? Where are you doing that? And is it just like, as soon as the task comes in, someone sends you an email, you get a text, you realize you have to get some personal thing done. Like where is your one source where you're focusing and throwing all that stuff so it's at least it's recorded? So it's there. I use I use Google Tasks. I mean, I and that's yeah. because my system is Google, but but I but I have used Todoist in the past and it's been really effective. And what I like about Todoist too is the way like you can nest tasks, which which is really nice. Um, but I I've just started using Google Tasks because it's right there on my dock, like it's so easy. Um, and and like for me, it's like, I, you know, I just say, hey, Google, or, you know, if you've got an iPhone, hey, Siri, whatever. And um, I will literally, like, it'll be two in the morning and I'm trying to go to sleep and my brain is churning and I'm like, oh my God, this has to get out of my brain. And I just like yell across the room, like, hey, Siri, like put this on my to-do list or whatever. And then, you know, I kind of take care of the mess at the beginning of the day, or for some people it's better at the end of the day and think like, okay, like then how do I organize this into my like most important tasks list or whatever. But, um, but all my digital data dump is like, is all just in Google tasks. And when I move it over is when it like needs something, like if it needs more attention than two minutes. So typically I'm not going to like move something over. That's an email that just needs a reply. Like I will move something over that is like, an email that requires me to like, you know, think through, I don't know, like three key steps or like give advice or like do, do some coaching or whatever. But if it takes less than two minutes, I do it. If it takes more than two minutes, it gets pulled over into my Google tasks. Um, for someone who's using a physical notebook, um, I would probably have the like the three columns, like my, you know, work tasks, my personal tasks, and then my big ideas, or maybe that's like three different pages, whatever. Um, and I would move things over onto the physical list when uh, when it feels like weighty enough, uh, when it feels like weighty enough that you actually are gonna have to like, you, you wanna like give it 10 minutes or 20 minutes to work on. So I'm just not a paper task person, um, but that I, I think that like, I think it's also, it's also a little bit of a, how, like what works for you in terms of like, what actually lends the importance to the task. So if you find that a digital to-do list, like just, it goes out of your brain, or it's not effective enough. Like, I mean, there are tons of things that show that like writing something down makes you do it. So if you're a person that feels like the digital to-do to -do list doesn't work, then I don't know, start with a small notebook. Um, I love the one that you were talking about. That sounds like super smart, that Evo one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that I've talked to the folks about before is like this idea of like manufacturing novelty in your systems because like, they're really exciting when you get them going, but then after you've been doing them for like months, it can kind of get just like stale and boring. So like sometimes I'll do like the little three by five note card where I'm writing down the tasks and then I just like keep that in my pocket throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Other times it's a note on my computer. So I feel like also having like a system that can handle those types of like flexibility where like even if I'm doing it starting off on a notebook, then it's still filtering down through the rest of the system. Like once I input that into the top of funnel, and then that can also translate to all of those other like ways to record stuff as long as there is that kind of flow to it. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. I mean, I think what you're talking about is building like building a really strong structure, like having the bones of your, you know, your productivity and your signaling and like the things that you're very, you're practicing every single day, but then also along for flexibility because Say if you got your notebook, like if your life is over, like it's, I mean, you're like, oh my God, if I don't have my notebook, my whole life is over. Like, yeah. right. so, so yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like building, being able to build on things and like, and create nuance 
um, can be important, especially if you're trying to signal that this is really important or this is a little bit like this is, you know, it's a it's a priority, but it's like not something that you necessarily like want to get lost in your whole list of most important tasks. Um, then maybe that's like what you do with your big goals, right? The big goals that you determine for, you know, the month or the or the quarter or the thing like you could post a note and put that on your on your computer and like it just doesn't live on your task list but you can use it as a way to like identify does my task like tie to these big goals that i've got posted up yeah awesome um all right we got a question from renee what's the difference between boomerang and gmail snooze um so well i mean i added like just that they're different tools but gmail snooze came about after boomerang so boomerang was already um was already like was doing this before i think what happens gmail was basically like let me pull up boomerang in fact um uh boomerang was already doing these can you see my gmail right now am i still sharing Chris? yeah 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 okay cool okay so like say i'm sending an email um at the bottom like number one you, you can like snooze is basically like bring this back into my inbox but Boomerang does that as well. But the other thing that I love that Boomerang does is you can send things later. So for me, for example, if like I was like, this was like a one-on-one, <clears throat> excuse me, a one-on-one -on -one consultation, like I would have already scheduled my follow-up thank you to like send a couple hours after the event. So, um, so I'd be like, hey, thanks so much for meeting with me, Chris. Like, great, blah, blah, blah today. Like if you want to request the deck, you can do that here. Like I look forward to talking to you in the future or whatever. And I've already got that scheduled. So I love being able to send things later. As I mentioned, I'm also like, I'm, I'm my productivity times like are really disparate. So like at 10 PM, I don't want to send an inbox at 10. I mean, I don't want to send an email at 10 PM because first of all, like no one's on their email or if they are on their email, like then they know that I'm a crazy night owl. And also like, it's not like getting to the top of their priority list if they're getting it at 10 PM. So essentially I will send something so that it goes like Tuesday at 9 a.m. and it lands in their inbox when they're ready for it. So that's what I love about, um, about like this feature for Boomerang. The other thing is that Boomerang also has this thing called Respondable. And it's not like, I mean, you can unlock additional things, but essentially as I'm like writing an email, I can start like blah, 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 like requesting things. And on the right hand side, it'll tell me whether it's likely to receive a response through natural language. So that's just kind of fun. It's a feature that I haven't played around with that much because I, I feel like, you know, you can write compelling emails pretty easily, hopefully, if you've been writing a lot of them. But if you are like, oh, gosh, I really want to play around with this, it'll, you know, do it based on subject length, word count, question card, count, count, sorry, reading level, et cetera. So um, those are the things that I, I really like uh, that are specific to Boomerang and um, that, are, that are not tab snooze, or rather Gmail snooze. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, I think I think we are mm -hmm. good. This was this was incredible. We got through a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> Hopefully, everyone got some at least a couple nuggets out of this. Because at least one thing went over a bunch. Um, Besides the flash, so this was at least worth it for me. Uh, <laughs> but thank you all for joining, Kelly. Do you want to go over those those links and, and things and all the call to actions that you got in there for how people can get access to you, get access to this deck, yeah. and all that? I'm easy to find. I'm just kellyjstalker at gmail.com. I'll, I'll make sure that that's in the present. Well, it's, it's in the presentation. Um, and I'm also, you can find me at kellyjstalker in general. Like that's where I am on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the things. And then if you want to request the deck, if you want to request personal training, if you have questions that we didn't get to, because I'm sure there were those as well, it's just bit.ly slash AppSumo ATX. It's easy. Awesome. Or if you are super productive, but you work in a company with a bunch of people who aren't as productive as you, and you want Kelly to come in and whip the whole team into shape, hit her up and I'm sure she can uh, figure out something to get, get everybody aligned and, and as productive as possible. Um, also, people are saying this was, this was brilliant. Um, yeah, super cool. Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time to hop on. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, people, people didn't even know multiple inboxes was a thing. So, so super <laughs> cool. appreciate you taking the time. Do you have any, any final words before we sign off? Uh, no, not at all. I thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you had me and, um, and, and I'm open to honest feedback as well. If you just want to add on that form, like, all right, like, uh, take a breath or all right, like this wasn't useful for me or this was amazing or why aren't you using this tool? Like, please give it to me because um, I'm always looking for ways to improve this. Like I said, it's a side hustle to my side hustle and I love it, but you know, we can, we, there's always room for improvement. <laughs> no, this was, this was great. So yeah, send her, send her the feedback, but uh, 
yeah, yeah. Hope you guys got something out of this. You're able to change your inboxes, change your productivity, and uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. So we will be seeing you guys soon. Kelly, thank you so much. We'll be, we'll be talking soon as well, I'm sure. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.